Well, thank you for joining us once again for our wonderful day in the Lord broadcast. Uh, we're looking at, a sh at the issue, the subject of the worship of God. And we've already talked uh, uh, some about the life of, of worship and uh, worshiping the Lord for His glory and all these kinds of things. We've got a lot more that we want to talk about in the future, but this week we're going to dedicate our time to God Himself. Uh, before we worship, we need to know who or what we're worshiping. People are born worshipers. People worship something. Uh, throughout the world, most people are religious. They worship something. Even those that claim to be atheists are worshiping often something. And uh, if nothing else, they're worshiping themselves. We're born worshipers and we worship. And so it's very important that we worship the true God uh, as he truly is. And we know about God through two sources of revelation, according to the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm, Psalm uh, 19, Psalm 8, uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, there, are, there are two witnesses to God. It's the creation that he's made that tells us of his handiwork, tells us somewhat of his power. It tells us of his existence. And so we have that, that, uh, that form of revelation that just a general revelation. And then there is particular or specific revelation that is found only in the Word of God. These are the very words of God given to us. And most of our understanding about God comes from the Scriptures, the specific revelation of God. So we turn to the Scriptures to find out what God is like. But even as we do that, we recognize we are limited in our understanding. No one truly, completely comprehends God. And that's recognized throughout the scriptures. As people come face to face, so to speak, with God, as they come into his presence, as they encounter him in one form or the other, uh, the natural, normal response is, is awesome. This is overwhelming. Uh, God is beyond my imagination. I'll read one passage of scripture today concerning that. That's Romans chapter 11, as Paul comes to the end of a very detailed doctrinal section of the book of Romans. Uh, he, he ends that section in chapter 11, verse 33, with these words, All the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be repaid to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So Paul kind of ends this section after going through great detail and a lot of, a lot of theology. He comes to the end and he says, you know what? Uh, God is incomprehensible. Unsearchable are his ways. Beyond the thinking of even the most brilliant man such as Paul, the greatest theologian, perhaps the greatest Christian to have ever lived. And yet he says that when it comes to the end of the road, I uh, see God as un. un imaginable, unsearchable. And that's the way it ought to be. So when we're, when we're trying to piece together what God is like, uh, we realize we're at a disadvantage. We can only go as far as the human mind can go, only as far as the revelation of Scripture can take us, and then we come to a, a, a roadblock, so to speak, that we can't get around. There are things we don't know. There are things we'll never know in this life, and I, I surmise that there are things that we'll never fully comprehend in the next life because God is so incomprehensible, so different than us. And that is not a bad thing. That's a glorious thing that we cannot comprehend the incomparable God. Uh, Tozer speaks about the attributes of God. So when we try to think about who God is and what God is like, we often think of his attributes. And his attributes are not necessarily the same thing as a characteristic uh, it, an attribute of God is, is what he is. Sometimes people might ask the question, and I heard this recently in a, in a Bible study, what is your favorite attribute of God? And as we think about that, we might pick one or the other, love or holiness or, or sovereignty or whatever. These are all attributes of God, but God does not come in parts. As the theologians tell us, God is simple. He's, one, he's not broken up into pieces. He is, he is a unit. He's, he's united. And so we can't just break him up into pieces. But his attributes define something about him. Here's what Tozer says in one of his quotes that I think is helpful. 
An attribute of God is whatever God has in any way revealed as being true of himself. They are what we know to be true of God. He does not possess them as qualities. They are what God is. Love, for instance, is not something God has and which may grow or diminish or cease to be. His love is what is the way God is. And when he loves, he is simply being himself. And so with the other attributes as well. For example, holiness is not something God exhibits at, a, at certain times. Holiness is who he is. And so he doesn't, we don't have him in parts or pieces. Uh, his attributes define who he is, his nature. And so each of these, uh, these attributes help us to understand more about him, but they are not divided from one another. God is purely and completely love. God is purely and completely holy. God is purely and completely sovereign. That's the God that we worship. Now we're going to look at a few attributes this week just to get a good handle on the magnitude of God. So I hope you can be with us.